Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man walah. Rabbi syrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Alhamdulillah we begin by expressing our praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of iman and Islam. And also for the beautiful blessing of this opportunity to be together in this blessed month of Ramadan. How many of our brothers and sisters are no longer able to enjoy this beautiful month? We should always begin by expressing our gratitude to Him for this blessing. This is the month where Muslims all around the world are trying to seize the opportunity to earn as much rewards as they possibly can. This is the month where all Muslims are striving to attain Allah's forgiveness through His mercy. But this is also the time where many of us should do our self-reflection and then ask ourselves whether or not there are things that we need to release and let go of. Because ultimately, we do not want to leave Ramadan or rather have Ramadan leave us and we are still the same person. Have Ramadan depart from us and we are still carrying all the grudges from all the problems and adversities that we are going through in the past. The topic for today is about how to have tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of great adversity. You see, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we as human beings, we will always go through some form of hardship, conflict, difficulty, setback, this is part and parcel of life. It's something that we cannot avoid. It's something that we can't try to run away from. One way or another, at some point, we will have to deal with some of those things. Some of them come from external factors, and sometimes it is just completely internal. The internal struggle to try to forgive, to try to pardon, not only forgiving others, but also forgiving ourselves for all the wrongs that we've done, either towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to others or even to ourselves. So, inshallah, in today's session, I'll be speaking a little bit about this and I hope that by the end of this, we'll all feel a little bit lighter and we'll have a bit more clarity in terms of what we should prioritize in order to attain peace in this dunya and Allah's pleasure in yawmul akhirah, inshallah. Now, let's ask the question, how does a person end up broken? We can end up broken for many reasons. For example, it could be that somebody dropped you. What I mean by that is, perhaps you were in a relationship and that person broke their promise to you. Or maybe you ended up broken because somebody dropped you through betrayal or sometimes through breaking up divorce, separation. That hurts a lot because you've put in and invested all of who you are, your time, your resources, all of your love was dedicated to that one thing, to that one person or relationship. But then the person chose to let you go. Whatever the reason may have been, it would hurt regardless. If you've been in this situation, then the reason for your brokenness is obviously very, very valid 
And you will find many people out there who can relate to what you're going through. Sometimes people end up broken because they dropped themselves. Did you drop yourself? How does one drop themselves by being too hard on yourself? You gave yourself so much expectations. You set this goal and that dream and this ambition, but you did not meet any of them. And what happens next? You start self-sabotaging and self-blame. And you're so hard on yourself to the point where you don't see any way for you to recover from all of your losses and all of your defeats. Please don't do that to yourself. We need to learn to be kinder to ourselves. And inshallah, we'll speak more about that in a short while. But there's a third reason why I believe that some of us have ended up broken. It's not that somebody dropped us. It's not that we were too hard on ourselves. But instead, we dropped God. We dropped Allah. We took Him out of the equation. We believe that anything that we were facing in life, any challenge or setback, we will be able to deal with it on our own. When people told us to pray, we felt like we don't need to pray. I'm smart enough. I have all the solutions, all the experience, all the wisdom. I have the skills, the competencies and abilities. I know how to fix this. I don't need to pray extra hard. I don't need to constantly make dua. Those things are irrelevant. So what did you do? You turned your back against Allah and you went on in life. What happens next? If any of those things that you thought you were so confident in being able to address and fix, but you failed anyway, that's when people get really, really lost. They feel so empty on the inside. Everything that they place their value on, for example, I place my value in my creativity. You place your value in your meticulousness. Another person places their value in how process-oriented they are in finding solutions to problems in life, for example. Whatever that you place your value on has now dropped to zero because that was the only thing you saw in yourself. So now you drop yourself and you also dropped your creator. Okay? He is the only one who could have saved you from all of these failures. So don't be surprised if you find yourself broken into pieces at this juncture in your life because of those past decisions. Now this talk is not meant to have a full stop at this, at this moment. There's a lot more to talk about. But I'm just you know, sharing with you that these are the possible reasons why we are where we are today. When we speak about expectations, right? Sometimes we expect things to happen at a certain timing in our life. I've seen so many people come to me at my events, my talks, my lectures, or even messaging me on social media, telling me how depressed and down they are. Why? Because when they thought they would be able to enter university at this age, they had to postpone because their parents didn't have the funds. The father fell ill, went into the hospital, for example. They couldn't continue. All of their friends went on. The timing of their life had, had been affected. They thought they would be able to go at 19, 20, 21. Now at 25, they've not started. Their friends have graduated. They're devastated. The timing of your life, some people thought that the moment you graduate, you'll find a job. Easy peasy. This is a good industry I'm in, right? They say, Ustaz, I was expecting to get a job like within three months. Now it's been a year. I've literally interviewed graduates from top universities. After a year, they still don't have a job. Can you imagine how, what that does to a person's self-esteem, self-worth? They now feel like, I'm nothing, right? Nobody sees any value in me. How can I start seeing something that nobody else sees? They begin to question God. They begin to question God's timing. Why isn't it happening yet? And then there is this large group of people who are always very sad that they have not yet found the love of their life, their life partner, somebody that they could call wife or husband. 
the person that they will be able to share their personal life with for the rest of their life. That hope gets dampened and it starts to slowly fade away. Every single wedding invitation you get from one of your circle of friends dampens your spirit bit by bit until eventually one day you feel like it's never going to happen, is it? You lose faith in God's goodness. You lose faith because perhaps you set expectations that are now far from it becoming a reality. So I want to share with you a little story, you know. When I was my second son, his name is um, Hakim. Uh, when I was shaving once, um, he actually looked at me while I was shaving. He looked at the shaver, he looked at me, he looked at the shaver, he looked at me, he looked into the mirror. And then, I'm pretty sure in his head he's wondering what am I doing? But at the same time, he's probably also thinking, I want to try that too. It looks interesting, curious, as any child would. He was probably around three or four at that, at that time. And then it made me realize one thing, that if I were to give him this razor blade right now at this age, it's going to potentially hurt him. He's going to cut himself. But when I give it to him when he's 14, 15, for example, or even slightly older than that, that razor blade is actually going to benefit him. It's going to help him fulfill a particular function and because he would know how to use it. But the point of this story is this. Sometimes in life, we think that we are ready for something, when in truth, that if Allah gave it to us too soon, it would have been a curse. We would have cut ourselves. We would have hurt ourselves. But at the right timing, that razor blade would be a blessing to my son. It would help him to achieve something that he wants to do. So when it comes to setting expectations and when it comes to the timings of our life, we need to learn to be patient and we need to learn to trust in Allah's perfect timing and wisdom. I know what you're thinking. It's easier said than done because logically we might think, I need to get a job by this age because everybody gets a job at this age. I need to settle down by this age because every one of my friends and cousins got married at this age. But perhaps Allah's, you know, we need to reconsider that Allah's wisdom is so much more profound. He knows when is the best time for something to happen. I remember one particular couple I solemnized many, many years ago. And it was one of the most happiest, most positive, most uplifting atmosphere of a majlis nikah that I've ever facilitated. And I've been a solemnizer for 10 years now or more. And what's interesting about this couple is that they were both in their late 40s and it was their first marriage. Now, I've solemnized people in their late 40s, 50s, and usually I would come in um, half expecting that they would have already been married before. Perhaps they were divorced or they were widowed right? Your partner passed away. But both of them, this was their first marriage. And, you know, they had the biggest smile and everybody was like happy for the both of them. What taught me in that moment was that sometimes you think that you're supposed to find that happiness at 28. But what if Allah says that you're going to find something that's so much better at 48? Who says that's impossible? Who says that is worse? Right? There are many people married at, an, at a younger age, but it doesn't guarantee them happiness. So this is where sometimes there is a mismatch of expectations. And also I would say a lack of patience and a lack of trust. Because we are so used to believing in what's uh, visible. When, I see, when we see people doing things at a certain timing in their life, at a certain age, we think that that is the only time that things can work. But that's not necessarily true. As Allah says in the Quran, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ And sometimes you may think, you may dislike a thing, but actually it is good for you. Right? وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرُّ لَكُمْ 
and you may actually like a thing, but actually it's bad for you. Who knows? Allah knows. We don't. That's why we ask Allah for direction. We ask Allah for guidance so that we may always be protected from harm and from disappointment. My friends, remember that sometimes Allah loves you enough to be late. Late on purpose can be a blessing in disguise. Okay? So now, the topic given was tawakkul. What is tawakkul? Tawakkul means, if we loosely translate it, it is surrendering our affairs to Allah. Tawakkul is knowing that there is a wakil who is assisting you in matters which are of great importance to you. Um, in a majlis nikah, or even pre-nikah, you know, when there is uh, the engagement um, process. Normally, the men would send uh, a convoy, right, a, a, a group of people over to the girl's house that he wants to marry, and there would be representatives. That's what a wakil is, someone who represents you, who is going to carry the message with the intention, uh, sir, we would like to approach your daughter okay, for the purpose of marriage with our nephew, for example, right? So, who do you appoint to be your wakil? Do you appoint your friend who, who, you know, who's young and inexperienced and doesn't know much about marriage, doesn't know how to be proper in this kind of settings, doesn't know how to talk about um, the dowry and things like that, doesn't know how to plan properly about the date of nikah and everything? Or do you send someone who is a bit more experienced, mature, wise, Okay? and knows how to deal um, and, and behave and deal with uh, others in that kind of scenario. Because marriage is a serious matter of great importance to you, I'm sure you would not just appoint any random wakil. You would appoint a wakil who knows what he's doing and who's capable of delivering what you ask. In the same manner, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, when you have big matters of great importance in life especially, uh, about wanting to migrate to another country, about whether or not you should, um, you know, maybe you're, you're wondering whether uh, it's a good time for you to change jobs during, uh, at, the, at the time of the economy right now, where it's still recovering. When you want to make such big decisions, I'm pretty sure in addition to consulting others who have gone through what you are about to go through, how can we go on without consulting the most wise, the most knowledgeable, the omniscient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? His knowledge, He knows of the past, the present and the future. Why wouldn't we ask someone who knows all of that? Therefore, when you say, I tawakkal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means I surrender my affairs over to Him because He is the best. He knows everything. And, and then you ask Him, for guidance, you ask him to, for protection, and hopefully everything turns out well in the end. So, now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, offenses that we experience. Offenses here means that you feel offended by the actions and the words of others. All of us need to realize one thing, that as long as Allah gives you life today, you woke up, you go to work, you go to the supermarket, you go and meet your friends, even just walking out to talk to your neighbor. Every day that you are alive is an opportunity for you to get offended. In today's context, you don't even need to leave your room to get offended by other people. What do you need? You just need to go to your social media and see what people are talking about. You post something and see what people are going to say. Somebody out there is going to disagree with you. Somebody out there is going to comment something that is unpleasant or even nasty. That is the reality of life today. The opportunity to get offended is very, very high. Okay? So, what's my suggestion? My suggestion is to make rapid releases. What do I mean? Because whenever somebody hurts you, you tend to have this one thing to just hold on to it a little bit longer, the anger towards this particular individual. 
for some reason, some of us unknowingly have been addicted to this, you know, wanting to have this hatred inside of us just a little bit longer. It feels better for some people, which obviously is unhealthy and not recommended at all. That's that, that, uh, that is why I'm recommending right now that we make rapid releases. You know, do not let offenses ruin your day. As quickly as they come, they must go at the same speed. It's funny because I see some people when you know, somebody, a complete stranger may have said something or nudged them and then they almost fell down on their way to work. They hold on to it till the end of the day. It, they allow that small little moment that happened in five seconds or less to ruin their entire day, to affect their mood negatively. And as a result, obviously, as we know, when your mood is affected by one incident, if you carry, uh, carry it with you, it's going to affect your other interactions with other people throughout the day. People are going to wonder, like, why, why is this person so moody today? Well, unfortunately, it's because you decided not to let go of that small little offense. And we'll talk more about that in a short while. The other thing is, we need to develop mercy in our hearts to allow it to grow and be more prominent, stronger, so that we can forgive others as easily and as quickly as we like to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said earlier, that Ramadan is the month for all of us to attain Allah's maghfirah and forgiveness. We all want it. That's why we always read, Allahumma inna ka'afoon, wa Allah, you are the one who pardons. Tuhibbul afwa, and you love to pardon. Fa'fu anni. So please pardon me. You want to be pardoned by Allah? Why not we show mercy in our hearts to pardon others? for the wrongs that they've done. Seizing your opportunity. When you hold on to your history, whether it was five minutes ago, five days ago, five months ago, you do it at the expense of your destiny. Meaning, there are so many wonderful things that has been planned for your life. In order for you to grab those blessings, to seize those opportunities, is for you to travel light, to not carry all these baggages with you from time to time, from year to year. Okay? I, I know some people who still hold a grudge over a person who hurt them 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It does not make sense. Most of those people have already left us. They are no longer with us. They have moved on in their life. They are happier. They have married or remarried. They have started a new business. Like we're still holding a grudge over all of these things. Who are we destroying ourselves? We're not hurting those people anymore. So let's seize this opportunity to let go and to pardon others so that we may be able to um, uh, acquire and seize all of the blessings that Allah is about to give us, inshallah. So, just now I mentioned that you know, some of the problems that we face um, are brief. You know, it could have happened in a few seconds, a few minutes. And obviously, there are some that are heavier issues that happen that affect uh, many aspects of our day. Right? My suggestion right now is for us to get into this habit of dividing our problems and categorizing them according to to how light or how heavy they are. For example, maybe some of your problems are actually just five-minute problems. You do not have to continually think about it for five days. It doesn't make sense. Some of your problems, realistically, are five-hour problems. What's a five-minute problem before that? I think a five-minute problem is like, you're at the bus stop, the bus is here, you realize your wallet is not with you. Okay, you had to run back up again. You're gonna miss the bus, but five minutes later, another bus is gonna come. Now you get angry, frustrated, either at yourself for being so, um, you know, um, being so forgetful, or you may blame it on somebody else. Maybe your child took out stuff from your bag last night and forgot to put the things back in, so you start getting angry. Oh man, I'm gonna. 
you know, lecture my son when he comes back from school today, I'm going to give them a beating or whatever, right? You get so mad and so angry at something so small. It only took you five minutes. But you carry it with you for a long time. And your reaction is more of an overreaction. So, please let five-minute problems remain as five-minute problems. A five-hour problem could be, and this has happened to me before, when you're driving uh, in the expressway and then your car breaks down. <laughs> okay? So, clearly, it's broken. You try to, you know, um, uh, try to off and on again, off and on again, doesn't work. You call the mechanic, you call the tow truck, sorry, and then it takes about half an hour for it to arrive, another half an hour to get to the workshop. You sit at the workshop, the person analyzes it first. Half an hour later, they tell you what's, what's the problem. They said, we need to call for the spare parts to come. It's another half an hour. <laughs> and then we need three hours to fix it. That's an example of a five-hour problem. But it should just be that and nothing more. The point I'm trying to make here is don't drag your problems more than they need to. We need to train our minds to look at a problem only as they are, but never more than that. If it's just this, then it's just that. Don't try to amplify it or magnify it or make it seem like it's bigger than it actually is. Okay? And you can go on with this exercise, what is a five-day problem, what is a five-week problem, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, people sometimes come to me and say, uh, Ustaz, you know, I, I, I get what you're trying to say, but you don't understand my life with us. And I ask them, what do you mean? Well, I have a very dysfunctional life. I, have a very dis I come from a dysfunctional family. And I get that. And I'm not trying to belittle anybody who has that kind of a background with regards to their life. You know, some of you may have had a messed up childhood, broken family. Some of you may have wasted your years through addiction. Some of you may have been broken because of a marriage that didn't work out. Some of you are still trying to recover from a failed business. Some of you feel like people all around you dislike you, either openly or quietly, secretly, and you carry this with you for a long, long time. And so you say, I, my life is a dysfunctional life. Now, I want to ask you one question. Describe to me a functional, normal life. Describe to me a functional family. In fact, show me one. I'm pretty sure you struggle to find anyone who can, who can say that, yes, my family is a perfect family. We have no problems. We have no fights, no arguments. Nobody disrespects anyone. Nobody has ever lied to anyone. We've never had any misunderstandings. Come on. Show me a perfect family. I don't think there, there is. I don't think there exists today. Everybody struggles in some way. But you might say, but Ustaz, I see this couple always post happy photos on social media. <laughs> this family always goes on holiday happy. They're always happy. They're going out. They're having meals together. They're always smiles on their faces, you know, family selfies. Well, let me tell you this. Do you think that social media portrayals are the reality? Or are they just a way to show how blessed they are? Right? But behind the scenes, behind the curtain, they have issues too. So, don't be too hard on yourself by saying that, ah oh man, I'm just not as blessed as others. Don't say that. It's not true. Because you are blessed, but your blessing may come in a different way, in different form. Just because you don't get certain things, just because your childhood was a lot more difficult than others, doesn't mean that it will remain that way for the rest of your life. How many success stories have you heard of people who had a messed up childhood, for sure, by every description of it, and yet today, they're a doctor, they're a lawyer, they're an entrepreneur, they could be a politician even. Like, you can achieve anything. You have to decide, of course, but you also begin by stop telling yourself that I have been denied of Allah's blessings. Th which is why the Prophet wasallam advised us that when you look at others, don't just look at those above you who, have, who, who, who you deem to have more privilege, more honor, more success, more wealth, more happiness. Look also at those beneath you. Because when you look at those beneath you, you will feel blessed. 
If you spend too much time looking at those above you, then you will actually start to think and believe that you have been denied of Allah's blessings. And that is not true. So, when we talk about tawakkul and surrendering, I believe that it has to come with effort. Okay? Don't, you know, th there's this misunderstanding in our community. Let's be real, yeah? Let's be honest. Um, when people think of the word tawakkal, 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 they think sitting down and doing nothing. Sitting at home and things will change. I think that's the wrong thinking. There is something else that needs to happen prior to tawakkul. What precedes tawakkul is dua and effort. Effort needs to come as a means to surrendering. So before you surrender, you work. Okay? Before you surrender, you strive hard, you struggle, you do all that you can do. So what, what are examples of effort that you can put in? Number one, think. That's an effort too. Most people don't think, they just do. Right? Think. So figure out what you need to do in order to solve the issues that, are, that you are dealt with right now. And then do what you can. Do what you can with whatever resources that you have. Strength, ability, knowledge. Seek others' opinions. Be humble. Okay? There's always somebody out there who can help you. If they can't help you physically, if they can help you uh, with, with funds, they can help you with ideas. They can point you towards the right direction. They tell you, go to that agency, they can help you. Go to that organization, they have experts there to assist you. Right? Um, go to this website, they will tell you how to um, you know, get a, some subsidy that will lighten the burden on your family. You know, seek others' opinions. Okay? Find alternative ways. We all know the saying, when you do something over and over again, in the same way, expecting different results, you're probably a lunatic. Because why you keep doing the same thing when the results have always been the same? Maybe you just need to make some tweaks, some slight changes and amendments in terms of how you approach the issues that you're dealt with in your life. Next, give your all. Give 100%. Stretch yourself, okay? I've met people before when, uh, for example, they have a, a couple that comes and they have marriage problems. And then I ask them, so what have you done to try to fix this problem? And they would say, Ustaz, I've done everything, Ustaz. Really? Yes, I've done everything. It doesn't work. This, prob this, mar this uh, marriage cannot be saved. Then I tell them, okay, list down everything. You said you've done everything, right? So list down everything and then <laughs> they're like okay we um, tried to talk to each other didn't work we um, went for marriage counseling didn't work anything else there's only two things anything else uh, 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 you know they're stuck in our minds we think we've done a lot but in reality we've barely done enough how can you turn to Allah Claiming that you're out of options when you've only tried two out of ten, maybe, options that is at your disposal. That is why I said you need to think first, you need to ask for opinions. That's where the ideas come in. That's where it, your mind is opened up to see that there are other options for you to choose from. And then give your all. Give 100%. Don't put in a half-hearted effort and say, ah, see, my business failed already. Did you work really, really hard? Did you make any sacrifices? Did you talk to a bunch of people? Did you network properly? Did you um, go back to the drawing board when something didn't work? Like, there's so many things that we've barely considered and now we've given up. So don't give up too soon before effort precedes surrendering. Okay? And of course, the classic example, when I was uh, a student, my teachers always said, you, you sit for your exams where you didn't study. You say, Tawak Bismillah, tawakkal to Allah. And you expect to get an A. How does that work? Okay, What? You suddenly you know everything. Suddenly you remember everything, even though you didn't put in the effort to memorize the lessons that you're supposed to memorize. So even logically, many of us would disagree to that. So in the same way, if you have issues in your life, please put in the effort first. 
and then seek Allah's help afterwards. Surrender to Him. You know what we are surrendering? We are surrendering the outcome of our efforts. We are surrendering the results from our efforts. That's what we are surrendering. Okay? So that's, not, that's something that we, we all need to, to remember. Brothers and sisters, it's all about perspective. Okay? Um, when you are going through one of the hardest, the darkest moments of your life, maybe some of you watching right now, that's where you are. I've had people message me, Ustaz, it's the first of Ramadan, but uh, my husband just left me. And I even got a message like that, Ustaz, it's the first of Shawwal, you know, the, we just heard the takbir, but um, I just uh, said the talak to my wife. I've received messages like this, people in crisis, People in pain, they don't know what to do with their life. It's very bad, you know. People who just lost their loved ones during the pandemic, this is the first Ramadan without their late father. First Ramadan without their mother. It's painful. The house is empty, you know. So as much as I'm going to share with you what I'm going to share here about perspective, I understand the pain. I understand how difficult it is. I understand that we're still grieving, some of us, but we need to learn how to move on slowly. Take, take your time. For those who need to grieve, grieve properly. Don't try to accelerate the process of grieving. It doesn't work. It's only going to make things worse. One of the things that you can tell yourself that, you know, you say, okay, um, I had to break off my engagement, you know, we're two months away from the wedding. We got into a fight. Both families decide to cancel. It hurts. It's embarrassing. People already know that we're supposed to get married. But tell yourself this, it could have been worse. And you say, huh? This is the worst thing to happen in my life, Ustaz. What do you mean it could have been worse? Well, it could have been that you got married anyway, and then two months after, you guys decide to separate. Wouldn't that be worse? Wouldn't that be messier and more complicated? Okay, so that's one perspective. Another one is, there must be a reason. I'm a firm believer that anything that happens, happens for a reason. And the reason is always a good one. We may not see it at the moment. Like, where is the hikmah behind all of these bad things that are happening in my life, one after another, one after another? You may not see it. It's hard for you to believe it. But if you have husnuzan towards Allah, if you trust in Allah's goodness, then you know that one day, one day, when you look back, you're going to realize, MashaAllah, if not for that failure, if not for that rejection from that job, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have met my spouse. We wouldn't have these children. We wouldn't have this house, you know, and so on and so on and so forth, right? There's always a reason and the reason is always a good reason, inshaAllah. Okay, so change your perspective. So, in, a, in life, you'll have a variety of problems and people hurting you and offenses that will take, take place. Some of them will be big, some of them will be small. Okay, but regardless of the size of the problem, we need to know how to control ourselves in our responses. I believe that life is... 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. You've heard of that before? And I think that is a profound perspective to have. Why? The last thing we want is to have the mentality and the mindset of always being a victim. That people are always mistreating me, Ustaz. People are always being unfair towards me. Like It's always about other people doing you wrong. Okay? And so if you live your life like that, you will never find peace. You will never find happiness. In fact, you will struggle to find purpose and reason to continue to wake up and do things in life, to go to work, to pursue your dreams. What's the point? You need to shift that uh, perspective by saying life is 10% what happens. This problem, you were lied to, you were underappreciated, you were overlooked for promotion at work, your child created a mess, a stranger pushed you while boarding the bus, someone said something unpleasant to you on social media, like all these little things, all big ones, 
this compromise only 10%. Now, what do you do with all of those feelings? Do you fight back? Do you throw a punch? Do you curse? Do you have vengeance and revenge? Right? All of those are options. What are other options? <sighs> you take a deep breath. <laughs> you try to look from a different perspective. You try to forgive. You try to overlook. You try to pardon them. You try to forgive yourself. You try to understand why they may have done what they, they have done. You try to understand why they said the things that they said, even though they don't know you. Sometimes, when you choose the right responses, life actually becomes a lot easier for you. So be careful and be selective. Inshallah, everything will be better. Now, before I end, I just want to say that sometimes I notice, even myself, we have this tendency of giving others power to control us, to control our emotions. Like for example, when someone walks into a room at, at the workplace, maybe you dislike someone okay, in your department. But then on occasions, obviously, you're going to have meetings with the other department or pe other people in the same department. And when that person walks into a room, your mood changes. You become cold you become even uh, impolite and rude in your conversations, in your uh, expressions, right? That is, in my opinion, a sign of weakness on your end because you have given that person the license to affect your emotions. Do not give them that power, okay? Or sometimes when somebody's name is mentioned, maybe you had an ugly divorce. And whenever that person's name is mentioned, you get triggered. It's normal. It's a human thing. It's a human reaction. It's normal, I guess, to be triggered in the first few months, in the first one or two years. But if it's been five years, seven years, why are you still easily triggered when that person's name is mentioned? Now, some people, they are triggered when the name is mentioned even though it is not the person. If you know what I mean, like maybe their ex's name is Faisal and they're talking about a different Faisal <laughs> and then, you know, like they still get triggered. They attach so much to that name. I can understand. You've probably lived a big chunk of your life with them, shared a lot with them, um, had children with them. But you need to tell yourself that Enough is enough. If after several years, you're still affected by the same thing, maybe you need to consult a therapist, see a counsellor and get some professional help. You need to um, care for yourself too. Or sometimes even worse, just a thought. Nobody's sending you reminders. There are no triggers. But even when you're sitting by yourself on your own, just you and your thoughts, you lose your power. You surrender everything to those thoughts, allowing those thoughts to win over you. My friends, forgiveness for all of those who have hurt you does not equal forgetting. One of the most common questions I get, they say, Ustaz, I can forgive but I cannot forget. Yes, that's true. You're not supposed to forget. But Ustaz, it, that's what's bothering me. That's what hurts. But you can't. This brain that Allah gave us has a powerful memory, right? There's so much space here to remember. And the things that, that it remembers the best are the memories that have the strongest emotions. From the happiest ones, your day of graduation, the day you finish your NS, you know, uh, your wedding day, the happiest moments, the day you carried your firstborn child, those are the most memorable. And the most memorable is also the most extremely negative ones. So you're going to collect all of these memories. You're not supposed to forget them, but you could learn from them with the hopes that you will not repeat the same mistakes again. So forgiveness is a separate matter. Forgetting is another thing altogether. Focus on forgiving and then learning from those events, inshallah. 
All right, so one final reminder, brothers and sisters, that when we say we surrender our affairs to Allah, that sometimes we need to let go of some of our expectations. Okay? None of those need to happen exactly the way we want it to happen. We always think that life will happen sequentially, like point A to point B to point C to point D, right? But life rarely happens that way. Sometimes you find yourself A, B, okay, everything seems good, so next should be C, right? Nope, you're going to jump to F, you're going to jump to K, you're going to jump to R, and then suddenly you're, you're back at C. And then suddenly you're back at F or whatever, right? So um, when you look at others' lives and it seems so perfect, I have friends like that, you know, like so perfect. They have everything planned out, s extremely structured, you know, like everything that was supposed to happen at that time did happen. Everything that was supposed to happen next happened. Everything was like all of their plans fell into place beautifully. I could look at that and say, wow, I feel so jealous. I wish my life was like that. But we are not supposed to live other people's lives. And we are not supposed to live a life where everything happens sequentially from A to Z. Because perhaps your life is more beautiful when it is lived the way and according to how Allah wants it to happen. Your loss, your hardship could be an inspiring story to somebody else. Somebody out there needs to hear what you have to share. They need to know the struggles along the way. Because why? Because they're going through something similar. And to see that you survived, that you did not give up, that you did not quit, is a big boost of motivation for all of them. So I hope that in this blessed month of Ramadan, we continually ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the strength to be able to move on, grant us the patience to be able to endure all these difficulties and hardship. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the faith to be able to move ahead in life with husnuzan towards His goodness and His blessings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our wrongdoings and then grant us the ability to forgive ourselves. One of the hardest things to let go of is also guilt. The guilt that we carry feels so burdensome. We don't know how to get rid of that. If, I, if we talked about forgiving others being difficult, trust me, forgiving yourself is a lot harder. Because there's this thought in your mind that keeps saying you don't deserve it. You don't deserve forgiveness. You're a bad person, you did something wrong, or you committed a sin, or you betrayed somebody, or somebody was hurt badly because of you, and so on and so forth. You just can't forgive yourself. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of you the ability to forgive yourselves. And please remember me in your du'as too. Okay? So I hope that from today onwards, when we think of the concept of tawakkul, you understand that before surrendering, you need to put in the effort, before you move away, you need to tie your camel, as per the hadith, right? We need to remember that effort and dua precedes surrendering to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness in this dunya and akhirah, and may Allah accept all of our deeds. Amin. Ya Rabbal Alamin. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this has been beneficial. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.